All the work I'm going to show today is embroidery because 90%, maybe 95% of the work that's going to be in the KMA exhibition and contemporary focus is going to be embroider, embroidery. So I thought I'd sort of pare it down to that. Um, if people are wondering, well, where's the stickers on maps that I love so much? Uh, uh, it's going to be very focused today for that. And, and I, th I thought I would say at the beginning that um, it'll be a different type of lecture than I normally, I normally give. You know, with I give my, my full body of work presentation, I, I've given a lot of lectures in the past couple of years, and I sort of kind of run on this automatic track when I give those. And it reminded me a lot of, I went to Ruby Falls recently. And growing up here, I remember going to Ruby Falls when I was a kid as like a field trip. And I have to say, uh, going back to Ruby Falls, I was a little disappointed. And I think there's two reasons for that. One, I've grown in stature, so it doesn't seem quite as big. Um, the second thing is I've been to Carlsbad Cavern since then. And once you go to a cave that big, every other cave seems to pale in comparison. But in addition to that, I didn't like the guided tourness of Ruby Falls. The sort of like you go on these where there's one person leading you three, through and they like, you can tell they're running through the same jokes that they run through like two or three times a day and the same things. And that's sort of like me when I give my full presentation. I hate to say it, but it is. So this presentation will be much more us venturing down into the cave together, um, unbeknownst where we go, things slapdash put together. I may not be as articulate as I normally am about talking about the work because some of them I could have only completed about a week ago. Um, so we'll sort of go through this journey together uh, and you can sort of bear with me. But hopefully it'll be like Carl's Bad Cavern, uh, more exciting because it's sort of an open tour as opposed to a prescriptive tour. Um, I'm starting with this work because I think it's sort of the keystone to the pieces for the Contemporary Focus exhibition. I did this piece in 2008, um, and what you see is, uh, and it will be included in the exhibition as well, because even though it's, a, it's, a, it's probably the oldest piece it's going to be, I think everything else is from this year, 2010. This, once again, is sort of the, the legend, if you will, on the, on the map of my work that will help sort of to figure things out. It was the very first time I used uh, the Ouija board image in my work. And I used it and I paired it with this map. It's embroidery on map. I'll zoom in so people can see the, the detail of the stitch. It's embroidery on a map. And the map is by Abraham Ortelius, a cartographer, a Dutch cartographer who did this map of Iceland. And it's such a wonderfully beautiful, I mean, obviously this isn't the original, it's a reproduction, a wonderfully beautiful map um, that really talks a lot about what map making used to be. You know, it was a journey, it was an exploration. Maps today are much more functional. Um, we stick them in our glove compartments, we pull them out, we use them. If we even use maps anymore because of GPS and um, Google Maps, we can get things, get two places now just by directions. We don't really need to know where we are to know where we need to go. Um, How big is this piece? It is about 18 inches by um, 24 inches of this size. So it's not huge? No. Um, one of the things about all the work I'll show today is it stays at a pretty small scale. Um, and that's a lot to do with the, the way I use my stitching is as line work. And if I expand the size too much, the stitching sort of gets lost a little bit. So it, uh, one of the things about my work for the KMA show will be a, a much smaller scale um, than perhaps a lot of other 2D work. Um, but for this map specifically, I think what's wonderful about it is it really shows the mystery of going to someplace new, the wonder and the terror of going and leaving home, right? That there are monsters in Iceland, that Iceland is, is full of rocky crags and, and, and uh, you know, bears stuck on icebergs. And in the middle, I, I, I didn't bring my laser pointer today, but you can see right away the V and the W is at in the Ouija board. There's a depiction of a volcano, Mount Hecla, and it, it it says underneath the little description of it that it's spewing <coughs> forth hell. Like it's literally hell is coming out of the hole in the ground. And I mean, this is what it would have been like for someone who's never seen or thought about 
a volcanic island to go to a volcanic island. But that sort of mystery and wonder is lost when we know everything or every square inch. And so one of the things that my work is about is finding that mystery again. And it may not be ge geographical or it may be how we turn ge geography into something that's mysterious. And so my interest in this map, I, 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 I don't know how the idea came, but um, to me a Ouija board is sort of the same thing. It's a, it's, it's a desire to understand something that we can't understand. It is almost impossible for us to understand. This sort of bridge, this link between life and death. You know, death is, is often thought about or depicted as a place, as an afterlife, as a, somewhere where you go, um, that you pass on, that you visit this place. And so what is a Ouija board but an attempt to understand that, a depiction or to contact someone to say, hey, what is this place like? Um, and there's that fear and desire that both of these, these mediums share between the Ouija board and the map that I really thought there was something there. Um, and so the Ouija board, there's another detail, those wonderful little monsters. The Ouija board started to come up more. And this is the only other time, the only other piece I've made with the full Ouija board on it. And it's, uh, um, it's a recent work. I did this this past year. It's um, stickers. This, hey, there are stickers on maps. Hey, what do you know? Um, stickers on a map. It's a Peter's World map, which is an equal area projection map. For anybody who's seen an equal area projection map, it looks weird compared to the maps we normally look at because everything's scrunched together. Um, and it's very dis, you know, disorienting for people who are used to, for instance, their Mercator projection, which is the, the map that you see growing up in schoolhouses. The equal area maps, um, they try to preserve the area of a landmass and sacrifice the shape of the, um, the sort of shape and overall coastline. And you know, they're very interesting maps because in a way they're more true. You know, trueness in maps is something that I'm interested in, but they don't look real, they don't look true because we're so used to a more comfortable lie, I suppose. Um, and so it, this started out with just layering these different things on top of this map. You know, I started with the embroidery to, to, to sort of denote that you are here, and I left the map visible completely, and then I didn't like that, and so I started to cover it with stickers, and I'm like, it needs something else. And, you know, like in cooking, there might be one spice you go to all the time to, to knock things up a little bit, and the Ouija board, I guess, is my spice. So. You know, I thought, we'll slap a Ouija board on there and white out. And suddenly everything came together in a way that really pleased me. Because once again, um, the, those little you all here markers in malls and in, in maps, they're supposed to make you feel safe. And once again, the Ouija board does in a sense, well, for some people, make them feel safe. Make them feel like they know something. They know where they are in the term of life and death and the great cosmic journey. Um, and so I sort of... Uh, I thought that was a really interesting conversation. Since then, well, like I said, this is the only one I had the full Ouija board on. The Ouija board has since left, but the letters and text haven't. And the work that I've done for the KMA show will be um, mostly, if not all, text on, on grounds. And, uh, and these texts are all in the Ouija board font. So I'm referencing that fear. So I'm not, oh, it's, every work doesn't have to be about it, but it's always about that fear and desire to know or to not know, to have that balance between mystery and knowledge that I think um, kind of drives us forward in a way. So this is um, a, sort of a major piece, I think, for the show. Uh, as you can see, there's, you know, using this embroidery, using this small scale, one of the things that I'm sort of, refer I, I feel like I'm, I'm constantly sort of referring to or the idea of embroidery samplers, um, doing stitch work to learn uh, how to do embroidery and then displaying them in the home or in the d domestic sphere. And for those of you who've seen the uh, embroidery samplers before or have them in your home, you know, usually they're sort of full of um, nice, plucky little phrases about um, growing up in, in the domestic sphere. So I did this series. These are all embroidery on paper with two different phrases. <coughs> Uh, God bless his house. God bless his home, which of course would most likely appear in a Brody sampler. And wish you were here. Something that we would say when we're away from home, when you're writing on a postcard, things that happen outside the home. 
And it's a series of four, but I like this idea that the little words pair up into their own individual small two-word poems when they're separated, um, and as you can see here. Did you do the photography or is that a I didn't. Day? In fact, uh, the photography is great. These are uh, pictures of UFOs that were posters that I actually got these posters in Roswell, New Mexico. Oh. <laughs> um, I bought them there, uh, they were wonderful, huge, I mean these are 13 inches by 13 inches, so I cut them down, I sort of cropped. The original posters are normal poster size, 24 by 36 inches, something like that. Um, but just, you know, I, those were some grounds that I had sitting around in my studio for a long time and never knew what to do with them and then suddenly got this, yes? How do you do embroidery on paper? <laughs> um, carefully. And in fact, one of the things that um, well, I'll, I'll mention again at the end, but another part of this, of this um, extra programming for the contemporary focus is that this Saturday I'll be doing an artist in action presentation here at the museum where I'm actually going to specifically talk about embroidery and embroidery on paper my process, how embroidery is used in contemporary art, and then what I do, and I'll bring some actual examples. Or if people are interested more in that process, I'll be bringing actual work this Saturday mm -hmm. from 10 until 1 o'clock. But show up at 10. Um, <laughs> don't show up at 1 and wonder why I'm not here. So like 10 o'clock, um, uh, come and I'll bring some actual examples. But that's the long answer. The short answer is very carefully, and uh, I use um, iron-on interfacing to help. I mean, tears do happen. That's why you'll notice that, let's go back a little bit. The stitch that I use most often, if, if almost 100% is a split stitch, um, there are lots and lots and lots of embroidery stitches. Um, but the trick is, if these, this isn't fabric, so if the holes get too close to one another, they tear. Stitches blend together, things go horribly wrong. So I just have to be really careful that that doesn't happen. Um, but the iron on interfacing helps. Nick, is, 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 embroidery, is embroidery just another way of drawing for you? It would be sort of quicker and easier to just draw. It is. <laughs> um, and for those of for people who've seen my other work with the stickers on a map, I avoid, it seems like I avoid doing the quickest, easiest thing all the time. But it is another way of drawing. You know, I went from that drawing background to a fibrous background. There's a couple of things about embroidery specifically that I like that um, traditional two-dimensional two uh, two media doesn't offer me. One, I like the, the physicalness of it sitting on top of the paper. Not only sitting on top of the paper, but piercing and becoming like one with the ground, so it's one thing. Um, all of the work that I'll be showing won't be in, in a frame. They'll be mounted so that you can get close to it and see the, the actual um, physicality of the stitch on the page. And then I like the connotations. You know, I'm talking about, and we'll talk about it more in this presentation, I'm talking about the difference of, you know, when bringing up the Ouija board, bringing up Iceland, I bring up place all the time, and place, you know, is often broken down to here and there. There's here and then there's there. There's knowing this and not knowing that. And the ultimate, um, example of that is home. You know, home is a is a very abstract place. Um, your home has changed several times throughout your life, but yet you you still say I'm going home as if it's one thing that never changes. But it does change. So home is something you car carry around with you. It's a, it's a place where you feel comfortable, and that home could be as big as a state, or it can be as small as a room in your house. You know, growing up as a kid, usually it's a room in a house. Um, where you can get away from your siblings or your parents or whatever. Um, but it changes, and the thing that stays the same is comfort, to know that this is a place that you can go. And for people who've ever experienced any kind of tragedy or trauma that's experienced in the home, someone breaks in, for example, you know how psychologically that can affect you and how your sense of home is broken. Um, and that's what I like. And so, uh, to me, embroidery has those connotations and has those historical traditions of being the, about the domestic sphere, of being a technique or a craft that's done within the home and perfected in the home. And I think there's a certain amount of that energy that comes with it when people see text around the size of an embroidery sampler. 
so I did this. This was probably one of the earliest newer pieces that I did. I did this in the fall of 2009, and um, I think this really got me thinking a lot of the bigger issues that I started making this work about, which is talking about that home and what is home. You know, we can think of Earth as a home, and for instance, space is out there. That when things happen, when there's invasion, when there's uh, contention, and that gets broken a bit. You know, UFOs kind of do that. You know, it used to be monsters on the edge of maps, like in the Iceland map, but now we've, we've mapped the world. There are no more monsters in this world, so we look for monsters outside this world who come, and, you know, depending on your outlook, it's either threatening or it's welcoming, you know? And that's, once again, that energy of, like, please let there be something else in this, or I'm afraid if there's something else in this that we can't explain. So, you know, not that I'm saying that you have those UFO photographs are real, but it's a desire for those things that are real. Um, once again, referencing those embroidery samplers is something that I like to do, and I feel like there's a severe lack of expletives in, in embroidery sam samplers. <laughs> so I decided to, um, to, to sort of even the playing field a little bit. And, you know, I have to admit that when I made this piece, I, I, I thought about that in mind, just sort of like in an expletive sampler, like what are the different... But after I made this, I realized that I've chosen words that in and of themselves are not expletives. God, or damn, or hell, these are all words that have practical application that no other word can do. But put them together, combine them together, say them in the right way, and they become uh, swear words. And I feel like that has a lot to do with some of the other stuff that, 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 um, that I'm making, is art, art ability to give things power when perhaps there are no power there before. Um, you know, the Ouija board is always an interesting example because I, um, using the Ouija board as an image, I um, collect them. And I, when I started working with them in my studio, one of my studio mates had, had quite a, she felt really awkward about there being a Ouija board in our space. And I was like, well, why? And she's like, I had a really, you know, an unexplainable experience with the Ouija board when I was a child, and I just, I feel like that, and, and, and there's, a, there's a sort of myth that comes also from The Exorcist, from the movie, for people who've you know, seen it, you know that Reagan presumably gets possessed because she plays with the Ouija board first. And once again, there's this idea that here's an object that you can bring into your home and it will suddenly like invade like a cancer. And I'm like, this thing was made by like Milton Bradley. Um, you know, I don't think that, that toy manufacturers are probably pumping out occult, you know, I don't know much about occult powers, but I think that it needs a little bit more than an assembly line to make them. <laughs> but that's the idea though, right? That there could be something that is mass produced that could have meaning, or we give them meaning. They're just objects, but we give them power. And words are like that too. They're just words, but suddenly we can't say these words. We can't say these words in certain means, you know, in certain ways. And so, you know, I, I find that really interesting. Um, and so I did this piece, I actually did this piece. This is an older piece too, maybe in 2009. Um, but I, this summer, completed its companion, its sort of sister brother piece, because I found this. These are all old, um, old uh, sheet music scores, and I, I do most of my uh, um, shopping for grounds at antique stores and thrift stores uh, because it, you find really great stuff. Um, and while the music in itself lends nothing new to the um, content of the work. Uh, I, I think they're particularly interesting visually what's going on and these match colors and I was like, oh, I have to get this one and do something with it. The word you see there is Old English, uh, the Old English origin for handiwork. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce Old English, but I guess it's <laughs> handiwork or something like that. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of with this piece referencing both the act of embroidery as something that you would do as a craft, as a pastime but also very subtly in conjunction with my other work as we'll start to get into it you know i do reference a lot the ideas of the occult of of witchcraft and these sort of mysterious mystical things as as a means of talking about the unknown and how we give certain things power and i think that in this in that connotation this becomes a lot more creepy of what handiwork could be or handicraft <laughs> when it's, i first look at this i see ge and rc thinking that this is something showing that Today, as you know, a corporation and something so specific and something so. All right. 
So mm -hmm. grounded versus what you're talking about. It could, yeah. yeah. That's what I, that was the first thing I saw. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to take that. Uh, <laughs> And then of course, you know, the pun, I love puns and wordplay because I use so little words, text, you know, I'm not writing epic poems with my, with my embroidery, I'm writing, and so I want to cram as much um, wordplay into that, sort of really taking off other text artists um, like Ed Ruscha or Christopher Wool um, or Jeannie Holzer or somebody, and how you can have as much meaning packed into a very small sentence as possible. So there's a play on words between handiwork and you've got me in the palm of your hand and you know it's supposed to be cute, this little thing about love, but there's something ultimately pretty eerie about, it, very witchcrafty like about having someone in the palm of your hand and the control that that implies. Um, another new piece is gonna, that I made for the show, I found this great uh, map already framed in a thrift store of Marblehead. Um, which is in Massachusetts, but Marblehead to me, I mean, the, the way this map was, was made, it seems like it was um, like uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth or something. Like, I, uh, it seems so magical and mystical and not real, but then you find out that this is in fact, um, I you know, took it out of the frame and it's one of those throwaway maps that the Chamber of Commerce gives you when you visit someplace. So I made this sort of camouflage embroidery where it says screw up. Um, once again, it's, a, it's lots of double entendres uh, added together. You know, the idea of um, uh, the, the ephemeral quality, I think, of this map, the idea of, of, of careful hand stitching, but also uh, um, a subtle um, entendre on, on working your way up the social ladder. I think it's either Marblehead or Lost of that drawing you can't buy there, there, so you can get screwed up from that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not Lost. It's, it's not Marblehead, it's not though, right? Probably, yeah. 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 It's, it's a dry, dry town. You can't oh, buy that right. here. <sighs> um, but I, you know, once again, I like this idea, and it was similar to, I guess, my Ouija board map. There's so many, uh, the Iceland map. There's so many colors happening there. It's a little disorienting to pick out the words, and so I thought I'd, I'd try that again with trying to match the color. And um, you know, you really sort of from far away, it doesn't look like there's anything on it. And then, where the shadow once again catches that that three-dimensional quality of the thread, it changes. Um, I don't just do text; I do symbols. And this is an earlier piece, this is not going to be in a show, it's an older piece, but I wanted to bring it up to talk a little bit more about how I take these things that have mystical powers and then sort of rearrange them and represent them in ways that once again we don't typically see arcane symbols um, done in embroidery, and I like that sort of um, tension. And the interesting thing once again is these are all different uh, symbols associated with the occult or arcane done on top of um, astronomy, from books from an astronomy page, these are really small about five by seven inches. And, you know, astronomy uh, uh, is one of those sciences that often gets uh, borrowed into uh, mysticism, astrology, for example, uh, that we can look at every day when we pick up the paper and read our horoscopes. So, you know, this is part of that, taking these sort of natural uh, occurrences or, 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 or phenomenon and making them something more. And up in the right hand is a symbol for Jupiter, um, a planet and a god. Um, the left hand are phases of the moon. The bottom right uh, is two different symbols. One is for um, alchemy. There's an alchemist symbol for the philosopher's stone, the stone that could turn materials into other materials. And also that creepy pyramid eye that appears on all our dollar bills that no one seems to know quite why that's there. <laughs> and then my favorite, the pentagram up at the top, which will play into the KMA show again. I feel like the pentagram is, is one of the most often misunderstood symbols because these days people see pentagrams and they associate it with demons and Satanism. But the pentagram has a really rich history of actually being not only a pagan symbol but a Christian, a Christian symbol for a really long time. Um, a, a pentagram with a point up like that is uh, in, in many, many religions a symbol for protection and even in Christianity a symbol for protection which each of the points representing uh, uh, the wounds of Christ, but also the star of Bethlehem. Um, 
And, but it's also used in science. Um, in, in Greece, it was used to represent a perfect harmony between all the elements of Earth and all these things. But like with any symbol, when you invert it or when you change it, you gain control of it or you, um, you uh, turn it to the opposite of its meaning. So a pentagram upside down with the point down was adopted by a lot of uh, sort of, uh, I guess, the Anton LaVey and Satanist sort of movement as an opposite of protection. Um, but that history gets lost, and a lot of times people see pentagrams and they think, ooh, this is evil, this is witchcraft, but not always. And so, uh, you know, that's part of the same story of how do things get power, how do people control that power, and, you know, what happens when we see, when we, uh, see these things and begin to internalize them ourselves and make our own meanings of them. Um, I, I, I've talked a little bit about the importance of home in my work and, and what that means as an abstract place. So I think homesickness is an emotion that is, is really interesting for that reason, that we can miss a home. Um, and there's that, it's almost paralyzing when, when people are really homesick about and the uncomfortableness that you feel. So uh, I found this book um, talking about uh, uh, astrology. It was called From One House to the Other, talking about the houses of the planets and their positions. But this seemed aptly named to talk about homesickness. You know, uh, this goes back to the arcane embroideries that were those symbols. I, I like to embroider in books, which is something else I'll, I'll demonstrate on Saturday. These little ephemeral books that I find usually... Uh, uh, and I'll show some more, but this is one for the positions of the, of the planets and astrological sort of timetable. And, and how those symbols sometimes get changed, you know, using the Freemason symbol on the right, which is really interesting to me as, as far as, you know, the history and mythology uh, and, and secrecy that the Freemason orga organization has. And whether or not they are controlling everything or not is, is not the point, is that there's at least a mythology to that. Um, but I like the fact that the symbol came from really um, humble origins, you know, a, a trade, a skill, tools. So these are, you know, the compass and the square are, are very um, banal, everyday workman <coughs> tools that have been in this, or in this um, presentation are imbued with so much more meaning. Uh, and I made a play on that with the, on the left, which is a pair of pliers that I, I got the image from a um, 17th century woodcut that depicted uh, torture implements that were used in the witch trials. Once again, common tools used for uncommon uh, things. So, uh, another one, uh, uh, this is called a Seder Square. It's thought to believe, it's believed to be this sort of mystical square, because it, uh, it, it's, it's completely balanced. It says Seder uh, Arepo Tenet Opera Rotis from the top to the bottom. You can also read it from left to right. And you can flip it up and read it from like right to left going, it's, it's sort of perfectly balanced. But it's Latin gibberish, it doesn't really mean anything. And you can read lots of books that say, oh no, it means this. If you turn this word this way, or if you, yes, of course, if you interpret it this way, it means this. But for the most part, it's probably no different than any other sort of fun um, crossword puzzle type, type uh, fr a phrase or game. But I, once again, I, I like the fact that no one can quite figure out what it means, what it was used for, but everybody's in agreement that it was probably something really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, this is the piece I, ne I, I normally never sh uh, share because it was so specifically made for a purpose, but I thought <clears throat> for today I'd bring it out. Um, I made this piece for a show I was making about werewolves, and it's called Grindel's Arm, and, and one of the things that the show about werewolves was about, I find werewolves really interesting um, monsters from our own mythology because they're monsters that don't come from out there, like in the Iceland map, they're monsters that come from within us. That any time you could just turn into this werewolf or a neighbor or a loved one can turn into this beast. And um, the idea of man as monster, I think, is really aptly seen in the story of Beowulf and that you know, Grindel being one of the you know, big original Anglo-Saxon monsters and then to have um, him defeated by Beowulf, who, seem, who seems like a man, but has extraordinary strength, and then 
kills Grindel by ripping his arm off at the shoulder, it seems a very monstrous act. Um, and I was playing off that story with a very interesting story where, you know, witch trials get all the, all the fame, but there were werewolf trials too. People who thought that there were werewolves, and one of the ways that they, they presumed that you could tell someone was a werewolf if it was not the full moon was you would cut off their arm. And if there was hair growing on the inside of the skin, they were a werewolf. Of course, by then, someone's already lost an arm. Um, so I thought, once again, you see an act of men behaving like monsters in order to overcome monsters, uh, which interests me. Um, this is uh, another little, one of these little ephemeral little books. It's a... Uh, uh, a witch almanac, which is still in publication. There's wonderful little, you can find them sometimes at, at uh, 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 used bookstores. Um, they've been in publication for a long time, and they still are. They're like the farmer's almanac, but with way more mystical stuff in them. And uh, I, I was sort of, this, the, the history of witchcraft is really interesting to me as, once again, a domestic practice um, like embroidery, um, who's traditionally practiced by women but not necessarily always. And uh, the word spinster, for, of course, um, a term for women who are not married, um, comes from spinning, spinning cloth, spinning uh, thread, because um, that was a practice that could be done in the home that women could use to make money. Um, and I thought that, once again, a word that uh, comes from a, a, a very banal activity or practice to be used sometimes you know, derogatively um, is interesting, and of course, a lot of the times, unmarried women um, were thought of as witches. Because why? Why wouldn't they be married? They're obviously witches. <laughs> another one. Um, I found this another book about magic, and I just love that that <laughs> drawing. This poof, some magical thing has happened, and suddenly is appearing or dis disappearing. And so I, I you know, wanted to play off that a little bit more um, and sort of copy that down the side. And there's one thing that I, I don't explicitly usually talk about with my work. My work and my use of embroidery is about the domestic sphere. And sometimes, and I'm going to talk about it at the end of this presentation, you know, it's almost inescapable to talk about gender roles as a man who does embroidery. It comes up a lot with embroidery being um, historically um, sort of a feminine tradition. But my work's not about that, so I don't, I don't talk about it explicitly most of the time, but sometimes people ask me to address that. Um, and it's interesting, once again, like our assumptions about what is a male tradition versus what is a feminine tradition, and what those two things mean, and what happens when those things break down. You know, so, of course, for other people, there's a certain amount of tongue-in-cheekness um, that comes from repeating the word poof over and over again in embroidery, Poof is a British slang for a homosexual man. It just comes up, you know. Um, once again, frequently for any, any man who does uh, a f a, what is considered a feminine activity. Oh, here we go, Carlsbad Caverns. Um, this is actually a, a print from, uh, about Carlsbad Caverns and a, a piece that's going to be in, in the upcoming show. And uh, there's a series of caves and, you know, I've talked a lot about geography so far and places, and these places have been mostly political geography or space, but recently I've beginning to think about how the natural elements of Earth provide um, a psychological equivalent to ourselves. So I like how caves and under the Earth and that type of imagery and speech is often used to talk about how we feel on the inside that there is a sense and a space inside of us, and it is deep. Um, and so this is a little series I did about uh, the Earth, and specifically about how being inside the Earth can be an uh, amalgam for, for being inside of ourselves and for thoughts that come from within us. So uh, these little phrases embroidered deep down, I am and underneath it all, this um, <coughs> operation. And this one, which I thought was, was, was kind of funny, this is actually a depiction of a volcano as it would have appeared. It came from an old book about the moon. This is apparently what the moon used to look like, according to this artist, which is erupting volcanoes 
Um, but once again, this idea of a volcano, as we talked about earlier, as something that spews something from inside the earth, as sometimes we erupt. We even say that. We use that as a term, that we erupt when we're angry and things come out of us. and They spew forth from us. And so we often equate, you know, we use place and geology and geography as a way to talk about how we feel and things that are happening in us. So it's the outside and the inside reversed again. Um, there are two pieces I, I, I've recently been in expanding and not just doing embroidering, but doing applique, which is, well, you could call it applique. Applique is cutting out shapes and stitching it down. In this case, I'm gluing them down um, on surfaces that usually that I can't embroider on, or it would be difficult for me to embroider on. And there's this great uh, coaster that I found that depicts some unknown place in, in, in Florida, I suppose, but I tell this piece uh, sort of paradise because um, paradise is a place that once again we, we have a, an idea of in our mind of what it's like and a lot of people think it's tropical, that it's you know, warm and that um, it may always be just around the corner. But I like the, you know, the phrase not too far um, has double meaning. You, know, you can say, oh, it's not too far to go down to that place or don't go too far um, as a warning and admonition. Now this is an interesting piece. <laughs> um, actually, this is a piece uh, that Chris and I talked about early on into the uh, advent of the show, and still deciding whether or not it's going to go on the show or not. Um, and I think that I, I, I at least wanted to bring it up today to talk about it because it's got a really interesting story. Because I had this plank of wood and didn't know what to do with it. And, and sat in my studio once again, as most things do, for a long time before it occurred to me. But the, 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 the plank of wood looked like it was already rigged up to be a sign that you would hang on a post. It had wire on the back. So I was thinking a lot about what signs a post are for. And, you know, the very first thought was signs a post are meant to keep people out. No trespassing. Stay away. Do not come in. And this had a lot to do with the stuff I was thinking about. The idea of having a comfortable space and keeping everything out of it that you couldn't control. Things that you can't control need to stay away. Uh, once again, very um, literally, this happens with, with keep out signs where you can't control strangers coming onto your property. You organize control. But as a metaphor, it has a lot, you know, if, if we begin to think of the home as ourselves, if we begin to think as the planet as ourselves, if we internalize this external geography, this was a lot to think about, well, what do we want to keep out? How angry would we be at invaders? You know, how angry do you get when your comfort is broken, when people uh, are ever involved in a burglary, or even on a personal level, uh, another thing I was thinking of when I made this was cancer, how cancer is this invading force um, on a body as a, as a comfortable place. And so, you know, I felt like that keep out, please, is too polite for the anger that we feel when we're invaded. You just want to scream at the top of your lungs, keep out fuckers, and just keep on saying that for everything, for for kids who roll your yard, for cancer that comes into your body, for aliens that want to come down and just zap everybody with their guns, all those invading forces, if you could just say one thing to them, what would you say? It's got to be this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, balancing that once again with this, with this you know, this is an interesting piece because it, it balances this, this sign that is outside the home, but I'm using, once again, materials that infer inside the home and comfort. Yeah, you, use it, you need to put it, you need to place it next to Home Sweet Home. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think yeah. that would be very important. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and another impetus for making this piece was I was reading uh, or listening. I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I make my work because embroidery is, is a very repetitive, dull thing to do. And so I, I listened to uh, audiobooks and I was listening to H.P. Lovecraft. And, you know, here's someone who was writing books at the early part of the century that was about invading forces. And these forces didn't come from, they weren't aliens, they came from other dimensions. I mean, that's even more terrifying. 
to think about our planet as our home, but to think about our whole universe as our home, and that there are other universes and things could invade from there. And, you know, I think H.P. Lovecraft got that these beings that would come from other dimensions were so hideous that you could not even describe them with words, and seeing them would make you go out of your mind. You know, that's invasion. You know, that is threat. That is the opposite of comfort. And uh, I, that was definitely uh, an inspiration for this piece, was um, standing your ground and saying, no more, you know, this is my space. You need to stay in your universe or your home planet or your somewhere. Oh, look, so uh, a sort of companion piece for it. I did this piece very quickly. I found this wonderful illustration of caddisfly cases. And once again, thinking about home and transitioning from homes and different types of homes. Here we have an example of lots of different types of homes. Uh, you know, I like the idea I talked about. Home is something that we carry around with us on the inside. And so I like it when I see examples of that happening, literally, where people carry around their homes. Well, not people, but animals or beans, turtles, for example, or, or snails or caddisflies that carry their home with them wherever they go. Because essentially, that's what we all do, too. Um, just not physically. Um, okay, so I lived for a while in Arizona. Uh, this will make a lot more, uh, I'll explain it, but for people who, who have visited Arizona, this, this is sort of a little bit more of an inside joke. Um, these are old uh, uh, postcards from the Oak Creek Canyon slash Sedona area. And Sedona is really well known as, the way I always kind of describe it, it's like New Age Gatlinburg. It's, <laughs> It's a place where people flock to because there's a belief that there are vor vor vortices of energy in Sedona. Places where you can go to that there's like cosmic energy just builds up there and flows from it. Um, and since that was discovered or since people have been reporting that and, and, and advertising it, Sedona sort of turned into this new age mecca. Um, and you have all these... Um, all these tourists come through on their way to the Grand Canyon, uh, which is really actually a, mystically, a mystical place, it seems to me. Like people go through Pigeon Forge and um, uh, Gatlinburg to get to the Smoky Mountains. Now, Sedona is a beautiful place. These are all images of Sedona. But it's this idea of turning something, this kitsch, kitsch factor, turning something that is mystical into something that can be sold. Um, is interesting to me. So I, I, I made this these pieces as sort of these, I imagine the person who goes to these vor vortices of, of, of power because they were told to go there or because someone promised them certain things and their response, a very banal everyday whoa or go gosh or geez, a sort of like Pell, you know, if these are places where all of the energy of the universe collects and is given to you, um, how would it be packaged as a postcard or a phrase? This is a new piece that, once again, I'm, I'm sort of, I feel like I'm, random, I'm rambling, but it's about that. <coughs> I'm ending with a, a series of three pieces. I think I ended with my last one on it. These are, are not going to be in the show, but I feel like they're sort of interesting pieces because they, they, they started the impetus of a lot of the things that I'm, 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 I'm talking about. And it was, as I mentioned before, I don't usually explicitly, uh, I subtly hint at it sometimes, this idea of gender in my work and, uh, in a sense, um, using what, as I, I said, a traditionally... Um, a feminine activity in, in, in being a, man, a male artist. So I made this piece, it was just the first piece I was like, well fine, I'm gonna make some pieces about that. So I made this piece because uh, about um, women in myth, I, I, I guess is a quick way to summarize it. Um, and specifically, because I was doing a lot of research on, on witchcraft and, and what that meant, and I found that like the pentagram, you know, the Judeo-Christian mythology shares a lot with, uh, with pagan, um, and they borrow and they trade, and, and, and religion is very um, um, amorphous, I feel like, and it sort of borrows and changes. So I was playing off the idea in this series about the similarities and differences in, um, in, in those two religions, and specifically how it deals with the feminine, 
You know, a lot of the times Wiccan and other pagan religions are, are moon-based, lunar-based religions, as, a, as opposed to Christ, uh, Christianity, which is uh, quite obviously sun-based, right? Because um, it's the son of God. And so I was riffing off the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, as, you know, for people who are familiar with it, a son who returns home to the father and is welcomed, even though he has spent his, has spent his life and sort of made a play on words of prodigal daughter. And the moon, who is our, like our prodigal daughter, right? It comes, it goes, uh, one month is here, and the next month it's, it's gone, and, it, and we always welcome it back. Um, in this one, which is entitled Mary, Mary, um, re uh, referencing Mary from uh, the mother of Christ, but also Mary, Mary of Christ Contrary, how does your garden grow? <laughs> Witchcraft, that's how, apparently, um, uh, as I got from this, this uh, which is our almanac, which is, um, uh, was, was telling you how to better plant your herbs in a very mystical, once again, the pentagram making its reappearance as a protective place. Oh, I guess I didn't say what these are. You know, um, this is embroidery on paper, and all that blue stuff is ballpoint pen. Uh, once again, I like to do things that take a long time. Um, so uh, I like to do things that take process. I'm very much a process artist. And so this is the same material. This is em embroidery and, and ballpoint pen, but it's a red ballpoint pen. How many pens per day? <laughs> ballpoint pens actually last quite a long time. Um, if you want to, uh, the next piece I'm going to show, this one, this one is the one that, that takes the cake on working with the material that, that you use up quickly which is embroidery in the center around Antarctica, and then all the white on the, on the outside is white out, which I use quite a lot in my work. I didn't show any of it today. Um, I've used it for a long time. White out for me is a great material because, once again, it looks the same as gesso. I could use gesso, but white out was made to cover, to edit, to hide, and those are things that I do. I alter, I edit, I hide, I change. And so I use whiteout, and it's a very um, frustrating material to use. It dries very quickly. The fumes are terribly bad for you. I've used them so much, I've, I've grown allergic to the fumes, so I have to wear a respirator when I use whiteout. And um, uh, it's expensive for the amount of liquid you get. You don't think about it, but yeah, two bucks on whiteout. But it's like <laughs> one fluid ounce of whiteout. Uh, but I still use it because of that, because it, it means a lot. And it's really quite beautiful when you put it out. It, because it dries so quickly, it sort of forms and solidifies like you picture ice. Like it groups and, 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 and solidifies in little, little lakes, little currents. And you can kind of see this movement on the page that depicts on how quickly it, it, it dries. So this is a piece that's called Lot's Wife. Um, from the Bible, who turned into a pillar of salt. Refer, sort of referencing similar things, salt ice, cold, and then of course over a cold shoulder because Lot looked back, or she looked back, Lot's wife looked back, um, and then turned into salt. 